Tonight. I was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy when I was six. It was like the worst day of our lives. An ABC 27 special presentation. A couple years into the Duchenne's, we heard about the clinical trial. This is a drug which ultimately leads to having better function of the muscle. He would come here once a week to have his infusions done. Clinical trials, research, and you. Sponsored by Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center and by Penn State College of Medicine. Good evening, I'm Deborah Pinkerton. Clinical trials and research studies are solving the mysteries of devastating diseases. The trials find new ways to treat patients and give them hope. There are nearly 250,000 studies worldwide. The Penn State College of Medicine is involved with more than 1,700 research studies. About 400 of those are clinical trials. What is involved with a research study? How are patients protected? And how can you get involved? Well, you will find out tonight. And if you have questions at home, Alicia Richards is here to tell you how to get them answered. Hi, Alicia. Hi, Deborah. Experts from Penn State Hershey Medical Center are in the ABC 27 call center to answer your questions, and they will be here until 8 o'clock. You can call the number right at the bottom of your screen, or you can email your questions during the show to questions at ABC 27.com. Now, Dr. Neil Thomas, the Associate Dean of Clinical Research, will answer your questions throughout the show. Tonight, all calls and emails are confidential, and I'm going to be back with you in just a little bit to share some of the questions we get. Deborah, back to you. Thanks, Alicia. A Berks County teenager agreed to participate in a clinical trial offered at Hershey Medical Center, a trial that has changed Ethan Pyle's life dramatically. Here's Ethan's journey. So what are we gonna draw today? 14-year-old hmm? Ethan Piles enjoys drawing because this is something he does well. It makes me feel like I can do anything I put my mind to and that it makes me feel calm and relaxed. And I just like to draw, I like colors and being creative and artistic. Ethan has crafted this skill due to many hours spent sitting as a child. Ethan didn't start walking till close to like two years of age. And as he was growing, I didn't see him meeting those milestones. I had a lot of difficulty riding a bike and playing basketball and make, like running around and playing with your dog. It, it was difficult. So they had suggested, you know, getting him tested for certain things, and we found out Ethan was on the autism spectrum. Doctors ordered blood work in order to start the proper medication. After we had the blood work done, like an hour later, his pediatrician called asking if Ethan was okay, and this was alarming to me, so I asked what the problem was and Ethan had very high liver profiles. The normal range is, I want to say, around 300, and Ethan's were 18,000. Okay, well, we need to find out what's going on. So first we went to a gastroenterologist, and then a rheumatologist, and they were ruling out all these different diagnoses, trying to get to the bottom of it, and we finally get to the neurology department. We saw the neurologist, and the minute he looked at Ethan, he said, your son has muscular dystrophy. Sandra learned there are more than 30 different types of muscular dystrophy. Now they had to determine Ethan's type. And it was like the worst day of our lives. We were told that Ethan had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and it's the most fatal. It's the worst kind to have. So this is a, a genetic disorder of muscle caused by a mutation in uh, dystrophin gene, which leads to decreased production of dystrophin protein in the muscle. Your muscles are going to deteriorate. You aren't gonna be able to walk. You're gonna use your, lose your mobility between the ages of 10 and 12, and it's gonna affect your diaphragm, which helps you breathe. Their life expectancy is in typically 20s, but most of the kids, they lose their ability to walk independently by 12th birthday. So they're wheelchair bound. The only way they knew how to help these boys was to preserve any kind of muscle strength, was to put them on a, a steroid regimen. 
So Ethan has been taking a steroid prednisone since he's six years old, he's now 14. Sandra found out Hershey Medical Center was participating in a clinical trial for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. They would be given the drug Exxon Dys 51. The drug company Sarepta decided to do a phase three to get more adequate data for the FDA to help them make the decision on approving this drug because there's, there were no treatments out there for the boys with Duchenne's. And this is a drug which ultimately leads to increased production of dystrophin protein in the muscles and ultimately uh, having better function of the muscle. In order to qualify for this study, you have to meet specific inclusion criteria. He met all the criteria, which was the age group and the correct deletion. It also included a six-minute walking test, which Ethan passed. I was so grateful because Ethan was at the end of his walking stage. You could tell. Two years ago, Ethan started the clinical trial. It's scary for us parents, and Ethan wanted to make a difference. And he said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to participate in the trial. I don't want it to just help help me. I want it to help, my, help everybody that has Duchenne's too, and eventually have every muscular dystrophy have a treatment. And, eventually be cured. When he first came, he was in a wheelchair all the time. He laid in the bed quietly with the blinds pulled and um, didn't really want to be stimulated much. And um, now he walks in from his car. He can run down the hall. We missed you. Piles, I missed you. When he comes for his visits, we access his Metaport and give him an IV infusion. We take vital signs throughout the infusion and monitor him for safety. And the infusion would last for about 45 minutes and then he would be monitored for about an hour afterwards. After several infusions, Ethan could feel a difference. Ooh, yeah, you rock. It's really hard to pick a place to start. Like, I can do all, a lot of stuff that I can't do before if it wouldn't have been for the trial drug that I'm taking. The list of possibilities is now endless for Ethan. Lifting up heavy things and basketball, using my arms for stuff. I'm so amazed seeing him, what he was not able to do before, now he's doing so well. It's very amazing to see that. His drive to help himself and help other boys has brought him to become very courageous and he's willing to do whatever it takes to make this drug available commercially. Ethan and his mom, along with the other boys participating in this clinical trial, took their success stories to the United States Food and Drug Administration in Washington, D.C. There they testified before an FDA committee. Phase three had approximately 180 boys involved in the study, and there were a thousand families, April 26, down at the FDA to participate in the meeting. I told them, I included in my story that stuff that I couldn't do before taking the medicine and stuff that I can do better after taking the medicine. Unfortunately, their decision was against approving the medication, which was heart-wrenching, but 30 days later, the director, Janet Woodcock, it was her responsibility to give a final decision. September 22nd, we were informed that the drug got accelerated approval. I felt like I wanted to jump like six feet in the air and do a backflip if I could. Ethan, along with his friends, the original 12 boys, and all the other ones in the study, they made history. I was very proud of Ethan for what he did. It takes a lot for a little boy of that age to be able to do that. Ethan not only made history by getting this drug approved, he hopes to make history with his future goals. When I grow up, I'm hoping that I can go to a good college and I want to go to a college in Florida that I can study marine biology, and I'm not going to let that not happen. He's inviting all of us to his graduation, and he wants all of us to come see him when he moves to Florida. He's determined.
you know, I felt very sad thinking of what the future had to hold for me, what my fate was. But now that I'm taking this medicine, I don't worry about it as much. I feel positive in myself. I don't even think that I'm going to stop walking. He's doing great. He's doing wonderful. We have our bad days, but you know what? 80% of our days are wonderful, you know? And I'm very happy. I couldn't be happier. I know my mom. She's what brings brightness in this world. She's what keeps me positive. I don't know what I'd do without her. I don't think I'd be here right now if it weren't for her. Ethan is here this evening. He is doing fantastic. As you can tell, his goal is to help others. He hopes the FDA approval of the drug he's taking paves the way for other MD drugs to be approved. Now joining us is Terry Novchich, the director of the College of Medicine Clinical Offices. Correct. Um, we saw with Ethan, I mean, how he's involved in this clinical trial and how it's really made a huge difference in his life. How do clinical trials work? Well, clinical trials are really research studies that um, explore whether or not new uh, devices or drugs or treatment opportunities really work in humans. It's a very rigorous process. It can take years and years through the drug development or device development, and um, that's because these studies have to work through phases. Talk to me about the phases. With regard to phases, there initially is a phase one, and that's a very, very small subset of participants, many um, healthy volunteers, and what we're looking for in a phase one is really safety. What's the, the dose of drug that we can give that is safe? We then move on to phase two, larger studies, more people, and we're looking not just for safety, but for effectiveness as well. Then we move to a phase three, and that's a much larger scale, hundreds to even thousands of participants who are looking for safety and effectiveness and a lot of other data. And how often do, do, what's the next step as far as phase three? Well, from phase three, occasionally there are some phase four studies, but generally then all of those truckloads of data are sent to the Food and Drug Administration. They review all the information and then determine whether or not the drug can go to market. And why should someone consider participating in a clinical trial? In many instances, it allows the individual to be able to receive some treatment or therapy that they wouldn't otherwise be allowed to receive and or how be do, able to receive. And how do people find out about these research studies? Well, it's uh, really you want to talk to your physician or your care provider. While over 70% of individuals in the country say that they would participate in clinical trials, really only about 1% to 2% do. So reach out to your care provider and find out what opportunities there may be available to you. And as well, you'll want to go to studyfinder.psu.edu. And there's all the information as far as all the different clinical Absolutely. trials, research studies that are involved there. Yes. Okay, Terry, thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Let's check in with Alicia Richards in the ABC 27 Call Center. Alicia. Deborah, the minute we gave that phone number earlier, the phone started ringing off the hook. Our phone bank is going strong right now. Here's the number again in case you'd like to call and ask a question. 717-346-3333. We're going to answer some viewer questions live tonight. Joining us is Dina Jefferson, a clinical research specialist at the Penn State Heart and Vascular Institute. A very busy and great institution there. Here's our first question, Dean. Okay. Thank you for being here. Sure. Uh, this person says, I'm interested in participating in a clinical trial. Is there compensation for being a test subject? Sure. Clinical trial participants are often paid. The amount of the payment depends on the type of activities required by the trial, um, if there's travel to the site, if there's certain activities that are involved, and the number of visits required by the trial. Okay, we're gonna ask you some more questions soon. So okay. thank you for that one. Sure. If you've got a question for a specialist, uh, feel free to call us, or you can email us at questions at abc27.com. Stay with us, we'll be right back. You're watching Clinical Trials, Research and You on ABC 27. Sponsored by Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center and by Penn State College of Medicine. Welcome back. Joining us, Dr. Patricia Gordon, the Executive Chair of the Institutional Review Board. How are clinical trials regulated? There is a set of regulatory laws and rules that come from the federal government called the Common Rule. 
and they essentially lay out the ethical regulations that any institution receiving federal funding has to follow in order to protect human subjects and research. We also follow a set of rules called good clinical practice, which are international rules for the ethical and scientific conduct of research. So federal guidelines are in place. What does the medical center do then to regulate trials? So the medical center has a human subjects protection office and the role of that office is to make certain that our institution is in compliance with all of those rules and regulations to protect human subjects. It also provides the structure for our institutional review boards. And those boards are independent boards that are composed of scientists, clinicians, non-scientists, community members who review all of the human subjects research at our institution to make sure that they're ethically and scientifically sound and that we protect the human subjects to the degree possible. Talk to me about the consent process. So the consent process is vital to making certain that we're conducting ethical research because for most studies, the subjects have to volunteer to be in the studies. They have to be able to say, no, I don't want to part participate, and they can't really be forced to participate. And so the consent process is a verbal and written process usually that provides the adequate information to potential subjects to allow them to make a reasonable decision about whether they want to participate in a research study. That information includes what the study is about, why are we doing that study, what we expect out of a volunteer, what the volunteer can expect out of the researchers, and what the potential risks and benefits would be for that, stu that study. We hear the word placebo. What, what does that mean? How does it work? Most people understand placebo as a sugar pill. So in other words, it's an inactive pill that looks exactly like the study drug. And it gives us an opportunity to give one set of patients or subjects an active study drug and another set the placebo so that we can actually compare the true good and bad effects of that study drug. Okay, Dr. Gordon, thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank Why you for having me. Thank you. Uh, let's check in with Alicia Richards back in the ABC 27 call center. Alicia. You bet, Deborah. The calls are really coming in. We want to keep giving that number because you are eager to get your question answered. Give us a call, 717-346-3333. Our phone lines will be open until 8 o'clock. Now, if you call us, looks like all our callers are busy right now. So if the phones are busy, just email us, questions at abc27.com. All right, Dina's back with us. Let's get another question in, Dina, okay? Sure. This viewer wants to know, once a medication from a clinical trial is approved by the FDA, how soon does it then become available? And do insurance companies help cover that cost? The, the drug being available is a timing thing. Um, the sponsor may elect to go right to market right away. They may want to talk to the FDA and the CMS coverage to get it covered. Each insurance carrier will look at the data and decide if they want to cover it at which, which tier of their drug policy plan they have. So each individual carrier will determine the timing. Makes sense. All right. Hey, okay. Dina, thank you so sure. much. Keep your calls and emails coming. Deborah, let's go back to you. Thanks, Alicia. Personalized medicine is changing the way doctors treat patients. Research studies are providing the answers to medical mysteries, and it's happening right now at Hershey Medical Center. Do you feel rested in the mornings when you wake up? Pretty much, if I sleep. Dr. David Claxton has worked at the Penn State Cancer Institute for 16 years. I view myself as a leukemia doctor and a doctor who treats that and other diseases related to blood cancer. As an oncologist, Dr. Claxton tries to determine the best treatment for each of his patients. We offer these patients treatment with chemotherapies and targeted therapies and immunotherapies and also uh, bone marrow and stem cell transplant. While Dr. Claxton spends about 65% of his time with patients. This has been in the freezer for about 14 years. The rest of the time is spent doing research. He's currently working on a couple research projects. So we're studying AML, acute myeloid leukemia, which is the most common leukemia in adulthood. So this is basically a project that's 
aimed at measuring the leukemia, defining how it's different from normal cells, and then using those differences in the course of the patient's illness to help answer the question, have we made the progress we wanted with this tumor, with this cancer, or do we need to do something different? This research is made possible through the Institute for Personalized Medicine at Hershey Medical Center. Dr. Jim Broach is the director of the Institute. What samples are these? These are saliva samples that we collected from patients that have MS. I'm getting ready to process them in our DNA extraction robot. Are these new patients that we have? These are the patients that we processed from this past week. Personalized medicine is the process by which we understand an individual's genetic makeup in a way that allows us to help predict a person's susceptibility to disease or decide what would be the optimum treatment for that individual. The Institute for Personalized Medicine opened its doors four years ago. About 30 different clinical areas at the medical center work with the Institute to provide more precise care. Here's how it works with patients. The uh, oncologist will first determine whether or not they have a cancer, and if so, one of the first things that they will do is take a sample of that tumor uh, extract the DNA, send it off to a company to have them determine the genetic changes that have occurred and on the basis of that information integrate that into the choice of therapeutic treatments. So patients receive personalized treatment. We don't treat all breast cancers the same. We do an analysis of the genetic changes that have occurred in that particular tumor and on the basis of that we can prescribe different therapeutic regimens and this has been extremely effective, particularly in the targeted uh, therapies that have been developed in conjunction with genotyping over the last five years, of uh, being able to have a, a remarkable effectiveness in uh, reversing the effects of cancer. And that's Dr. Claxton's goal for his patients. I think that what we're doing is going to change the way other people elsewhere do this sort of work. I think it's ultimately going to find its way into day-to-day -day routine leukemia evaluation and treatment. But I think that what we're doing here is very innovative. We feel it's absolutely essential for the future. As you can see, research studies play a very important role at the Medical Center. Joining us right now is Dr. Jennifer Krasniewski, the Executive Director of Pro Wellness. Thanks for being here. There is a difference between clinical trials and research studies. So clinical trials are one specific type of research study, but there's also other types of studies, such as public health research. And this can differ because these studies typically involve healthy volunteers to participate, and they study things outside of the clinical setting. Okay, and how? tell me about healthy volunteers. Healthy volunteers can participate in both clinical trials and research studies, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Healthy volunteers are really important to research studies. They can help us understand the difference between patients who have a disease and who don't, and even help us determine appropriate treatments or disease prevention. Give me some examples of research studies that you're involved in. So one of the current research studies we're involved in is studying the impact of an exercise program on senior adults who have suffered from a fragility fracture or a fall that results in a broken bone. Okay, and how do people get involved with these research studies? Through the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, Penn State has access to a national tool called Study Finder, which allows us to, to direct people who are interested in research to all of the studies that are currently recruiting. If people are potentially considering being a participant in research, they can visit us at the website, which is studyfinder.psu.edu. And we all have busy schedules. Some people may say, I don't have enough time to do a research study pr to participate in one. How long do they last? So research studies vary depending on the type of study and the study protocol, but they could be as straightforward and simple as one single visit that might involve answering some interview questions or a questionnaire to studies that last many years in duration. But participants are told right up front so they can use that and factoring it into their decision. And what about ages? 
all p research um, studies recruit different participants, but children through adults can participate depending on the study itself. And they really are making a difference at the medical center. Absolutely. It's only through engaging people in research studies that we can make the medical advances to help all of us live healthier. Just like we have seen in Ethan's piece. I mean, absolutely. how that drug has made a huge difference in his life. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Dr. Krasniewski, thank you for being here with us this evening. Uh, we also want to thank you, our viewers, for sharing your stories and sending in your questions. Thanks for watching tonight. We wish you good health.